Hello everyone, today we talk about the Persian cavalry horse between, let's say, the uh, late Achaemenic period, you can say the, the, the 4th century and the 2nd century BC, right? Uh, I'm planning actually to go back uh, um, to properly the um, Greek, uh, let's say, to classical Hellenic times uh, in Persian wars, right? Today, it's really not the case. It's really part of the the Hellenistic uh, time. So much that we speak specifically of not just the the late Achaemenids, but naturally uh, the the Arsacids, etc. And more broadly, whoever actually used these type of horses, uh, the history behind um, properly um, cavalry horse uh, historical military history is, is very fascinating. It's very complicated as well, right? We don't have uh, the sources are tricky because we have naturally lots of horses themselves. We have the genetic proofs of what they were and the, the breeds and the crossing, etc. But it's very complicated to properly track it historically, right? It's not that we lack the properly the, like with humans the genetic evidence. The problem is how do we know a certain um, properly genotype was uh, at a given point in history and where, right? And as you know, um, Persian equestrian tradition was definitely one of the most developed uh, in the, let's say, we can here speak of a broader, uh, you'd say Middle East in practice, but, you know, Persian warfare influenced importantly uh, Western warfare itself, right? It, it spread fundamentally from Persia, also for, for many other cultures that we know uh, later uh, in time, also, I don't know, for our medieval history studies during the Islamic invasions, etc. Um, and that left a mark even properly in horse breeds, and especially these ones, such as the, the famous Nizayan type of, of media, Nizayan, Nizayan, but you can say uh, Nizayan, Nizayan, the Zen Valley is in the Zagros Mountains of Iran, and this, was, this valley was famous for uh, uh, producing this very tough and very specific breed of of, of war horses, right? Uh, specifically meant. Naturally, there was a lot in common here with the uh, Fergana horses, the uh, the heavenly ones that were so famous that the uh, Tokarians exported to to China, etc. So we're talking about with with um, with Persia of naturally the the branch of a uh, essentially um, the continuation of a of a Central Asian tradition of uh, dramatic military quality um, and in in Western culture that is also the one that in fact renders a bit complicated to understand where and how these breeds spread. Right, uh, the Nizayan horses were famous everywhere in the world. Were imports uh, in many areas. The, the Spartans imported Nizayan horses from the Persians, as they, they were the main allies after the uh, the Persian Wars. The same Octavian, once he uh, crushed Antony, uh, uh, he basically brought to to Rome the Nizayan horses. The same. Arrival had raided in Media, Atropatene, and in Armenia, where these um, breeds properly were, were to be found. Uh, also, crossbreeds, as we will see, Cilicia, for example, was another region where, you know, uh, together with Armenia, where there weren't quite the same type of breeds of Persia, but um, something similar to them. Uh, and in general, there is uh, a a difficulty to stereotype a specific type of horse in here, not just because of the, of the aforementioned difficulties, but also properly to make it um, sensible from a military logical point of view, because uh, the history of, of cavalry in these areas is also complex, and we don't know an enormous much. When we talk about, I don't know, our Sassid cavalry, for these uh, centuries, also later on, even when they met with the Romans. We, we don't have this dramatic amount of evidence, right? It's mostly iconographic. Even archaeologically, we have really a few. So uh, we mostly rely on uh, on these few evidence, on, you know, also on historiography, uh, etc., 
And we have, a, however, still a pretty sketchy view of what properly, you know, even the, the tactical segmentation of their cavalry could be, right? The most famous type of cavalry here you can uh, recognize are, are the cataphracts, right? That, however, didn't have, I mean, the full um, bodied ones, right? The ones that were actually rare, that mostly kicked in in, in the Middle East with um, with the Arsacids, not much with previously with the Achaemenids, that as far as we understand, um, not just didn't have as basically all peoples most of their horses armored. Right, sometimes even properly the heavier cavalry was uh, unarmored uh, in horses, um, but that um, in fact um, didn't didn't have full cataphracts themselves. They surely could levy very fine. Saka mercenaries from the northern steppes, from which at the end of the day they had come themselves. So it's likely that they may have, you know, displayed that there is all an evolution also in steppes armor uh, that is, is, is um, uh, generally linear, but to simplify it, but that took its own time. I mean, technology in these areas was improving exactly in these centuries, um, and that therefore it corresponded also to a different type of warfare. Right, if we want to approximate Persia, the Iranian plateau, and also eventually where the Achaemenid Empire was built, so mostly in Mesopotamia, where the great Achaemenid Assyrian Empire did also uh, the Persian one fundamentally, you know, walked in, um, you know, let's say legacy that the Persian Empire walked into, and all the sedentary areas of the Near East, Asia Minor, so these were very different areas from Central Asia. Right from which these peoples had properly come, the the foundation of the Achaemenid Empire is to be interpreted as just one of of the many Scythian um, raids slash migrations uh, in into the Middle East that succeeded, managed to stabilize, to create another empire. But fundamentally, the source is always at this point the Indo-European steppe. Right at this time, the time the Indo-Europeans dominate the steppes, you know, from migration era onwards, it would be mostly the Turks instead to get uh, the better of it. Um, and um, there was probably in there all a uh, you know, modification of cavalry that changed importantly so much that most Persian cavalry, even in its feudal nature, uh, in Xenophon denounces in the Kuropedia the, the, the gradual. You know, lack of you know the gradual uh, gentrification of the cavalry, of Persian cavalry, also the you know uh, speculations and subcontracts of 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 uh, for cavalry recruitment was central to these peoples. These were properly Aryans that believed that the hero is on horseback, etc. Then eventually they started subcontracting to to, to civilians that to basically to 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 save the money that were given by the the king. To 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 speculate on the quality of the troops that decreased, right? Um, but they were normally um, lighter cavalry than the ones of the steps were properly the full cataphract w was developed. There is also the certain time in history uh, from the steps the the original combination properly of of shock and also missile type of trooper that is that cataphract originally also used. A bow, uh, which is not something so strange, thinking that obviously any kind of horseman knew uh, how to use a bow, but you know that tactically speaking, I think it would gradually differentiate for which the, for in a broader collective sense on the field, where you know civilized armies were, were developed in the startle sense, where you have just from one side the ultra heavy elite shock uh, cataphract cavalry that does just that where it's something extremely powerful but also extremely slow and you know, it exhausts its entire very easily because of all the weight of an armor for which these breeds were properly conceived and then the horse archer right initially the two things in, among the the great uh, you know the, the the heroes of central asian steps of the, the aristocrats etc were were combined Right, and uh, and even in here there is all a uh, consideration to it because also material wealth changes in the steps. That is, what was like the average? I don't know the first Achaemenid troops concretely like. We mostly see unarmored cavalry as we were seeing before, and the Nizayan breed was maybe not just used for ultra heavy cavalry. Also, what does heavy cavalry mean? Right, we, m people usually start. Uh, at some point, I also in the earlier videos, I reasoned along that pattern, like you know that sometimes they overlap, but they're not really always the same. That is, the more armor 
right? You, you say if it's armored cavalry, it's heavy cavalry. Well, not not really. There are ultra heavy cavalries that are fundamentally unarmored in horses and sometimes even in in, in men by a certain degree, right? Um, this idea of the, especially in the steps, you find this among the Sarmatians, etc. You know, troops that are relatively a lack in armor, also because they come from, you know, material cultures that are substantially poor, right? The ultra elite can be well armored, but the overwhelming amount of people is not. And even the uh, the aristocratic elite has to properly prove also to be able to fight unarmored. This is something that is to be found also, I don't know, in Seljuk warfare later on. It is properly the ones that come from the hardcore steppes, uh, warfare of Central Asia also are guys that have to have the guts literally to uh, to wrestle with enemy cavalrymen on horseback, uh, doing the the worst kind of acrobacies and uh, pirouettes, etc. To I don't know, do things that were considered in, in famous, like you know, for for those who suffered, like you know, the pulling the horse's uh, tail, things like that, uh, proving that they would be devoid of any kind of fear because the religious beliefs that these people have uh, that are dramatically eradicated, uh, rooted into, especially this Aryan background, the, the, the Persian nobility was literally obsessed with the military glory of the sky they, they sent, you know, that basically they couldn't even tell a lie because otherwise the, the winged glory would, would, would fly away, literally from them and so on, retained this even these ideal forms of warfare that are... The Achaemenid Empire, I think it's in its ideology, is possibly the most representative cultures of all among the, at least the sedentarized, um, the sedentary ones, let's say. Um, and that, however, can show unarmored cavalry designed still to shock charge, right? And of course, we have to debunk a bit of a war game mystic myth that is, of course, that there is some kind of cavalry that is conceptually not conceived to charge at all, right? Um, this is nonsense, right? In combined arms, of course, as we were saying before, there can be a very strict subdivision of, of, of tactical roles, but the any mass that you can dispose of, by a degree, can uh, charge, can, can literally operate a shock tactic, right? And cavalry especially so. Right, especially against a tired enemy or whatever. So this will point to get down to one thing at ease. Uh, even when you see a lighter trooper, doesn't mean that this was not necessarily aggressive from a tactical point of view. Um, and also, as cavalry, that in fact the, the lack of armor can be compensated still by the the, the, the dramatic speed and um, and mass of, of the horse. That in these breeds might, uh, in fact, have been it w was especially conceded. In fact for having an aggressive horse from one side also very aggr aggressive against the enemy as we will see but properly docile or at least obedient uh, for you know for the rider so much that they were trained literally to 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 to, to move to to go the dire chosen direction with a minimal move of of the rider with a minimum uh, uh let's say uh, ward, right? So they were trained especially like this. These were all breeds that were specifically conceived to have to provide this kind of reliability to the rider on the field, right? And that's why it also were pro they were probably war horses, right? But still, the thing is that these were pretty beefy, muscular animals that uh, definitely weighted a lot costed a lot. So yes, tendentially there were about uh, four heavy cavalry. It's just in some environments, as we were saying before, we can't find them even for lighter troops. What are the characteristics? Or do they had a very essentially large neck, large shoulder, so that it was all about for uh, making them oxygenate at the moment, right? So that's also what they were so beefy, because it's like, you know, for, you know, the, the larger the muscle, the, the more oxygen you need to make it, to, to to irritate it, to make it work. And even though these animals were surely very re resilient on the long run, because the horse, generally speaking, is, right, it's also very fragile, right? If you cripple it, it's of no use anymore, but still the horse has an, ex an extreme endurance, right? It can make, I don't know, up to 150 kilometers in a day, and it stops, it simply can't make, but still can't provide these things. 
But still, this type was preferred for properly those um, shock charges that needed fundamentally a very rapid, immediate, but still extremely powerful physical capacity, right? And to crush the enemy in this way, and this naturally is typical of heavy cavalry that sometimes can charge literally at pace. Some people don't know this, right? Of course, most cavalry charges were led basically, you know, they, they, they approached at the pace at some point, they just slightly accelerated, they reached canter, right, at, at, it, at you know, at the, the medium speed, is something like 40, 45 kilometers per hour. Then full charge is something that ideally you, you do just in the last, I don't know, 100 meters. It's not even advisable, right? But it's, uh, some knights are so heavy, like all together with the horse and all, are so heavy that even just if you literally charge, let's say, at pace, which happened historically, it's documented, you can smash through an enemy line with an incredible power that literally destroys everything fights in, in its own way, uh, human anatomically wise. Uh, consider that these animals were literally stronger, like stallions historically uh, were, you know, what an average stallion does like by going at canter uh, as power is is literally uh, identical to the top human extreme kind of monster um, uh, weight lifters, right? So that is to say the maximum of, of human power is normally what these guys, these guys, these horses do uh, regularly, right? And not even when they are at the top. So it means that if you are in front of a, a cavalry charge of these people, you become marmalade. doesn't matter if you are a bodybuilder or whatever, you're utter nothing, physically speaking. And this is not just because of the horse, it's just because the wall tactic and, our, and our arms and armor are functionalized to wipe out uh, human beings with the minimal effort. So never think that uh, physical fitness um, properly ha is, is something, you know, relevant in the broader picture of combat, right? Uh, uh, human body is literally one of the weakest thing you can ever imagine, even in, by, you know, strong people's standards. It's literally insignificant in the broader uh, tactical picture. And, uh, of course, collective training is everything. And these horses, in fact, were, as we were saying before, uh, trained to be perfectly obedient. The main deal of a cavalry charge is to remain perfectly aligned, not to create breaks, gaps, to fully maximize the homogeneous impact of this overwhelming force, and especially psychological shock, right? Uh, cavalry destroys first with the mind, like everything, right? It's never about properly the physical destruction, it's, it's the psychological shock first. Um, um, there is hardly anything in the history of warfare as more traumatizing and unbearable like remaining in front of, of a cavalry charge. Don't think that with shells or machine guns things change properly because we know that even by you know modern uh, military standards, m modernly trained troops uh, cannot, they, they break, that they, 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 they ner their nerves do not hold on average when they're presented with a cavalry charge, even a mock one. Right, so you can imagine a real one, and especially by these beasts and their riders. Um, so, these animals, as we've seen, were were known for their size and strength. There, there was some kind of a you know some variety here. We can't even I don't have any specific zoological um, you know here understanding of all the history of the races and and all. And all. Um, it's just as we we're saying before historically. We, we don't even know much. Reliefs, mostly, sh um, show us that these animals, albeit beefy, as most actual, mm, you know, of the strongest horses ever bred for war, uh, were not especially tall, right? Uh, height was not properly important. It was, um, even by ancient standards, specifically. Right, uh, the the horses sculptured at Persepolis scale up at about fourteen, fifteen hands. Right, the most important thing is that they were heavily and solidly built. Right, they had, as we've seen, these large heads, these beautiful curvy, heavy necks. Right, that's the most um, 
you know, evident uh, characterizing feature of these animals. Uh, war horses were normally stallions as well. They were properly meant to be aggressive, evil, right? You know, the, the, there is properly a psychological selection because you, you, you do know that aside, even among stallions, not all not all reason the same way. Of course, horses are very intelligent animals. They are smart. They they understand a freaking lot of what is happening in the field. Uh, but uh, there is a myth uh, that sometimes indulge myself on that is to say, you know, cavalry charges normally, you know, because horses stop in front of obstacles. Uh, this is not entirely true. There are, there are certain instances in which this is true, uh, but it's not always true, in the sense that the, the majority of horses, yes, does stop in front of obstacles, even in front of, of, of corpses. It doesn't step on them and things like that. But uh, the myth that, 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 a, that a horse wouldn't actually be able to smash itself, even with consistent physical damage against an obstacle, is a bit of a myth. And, and paradoxically, these horses for were chosen specifically for that purpose right we know even in ranches some horses freak out go go smash they they, they break the their own bones by smashing against a fence right every once in a while and it's actually in in in, in warfare the the horseman that freaks out doesn't want to smash into the enemy lines and that is the, the one that that may, can make a cavalry charge fail in that regard um, when you see cavalry charges are, we have to make a video on it at some point. They're normally mediated, right? They soften. First of all, some other units soften up the enemy lines. In this case, also horse archers and things like that. And the heavier ones arrive. They don't charge always straight away. There can be a lot of preparation. It is to say, properly to test the solidity of the enemy line, because it could be at that point. Um, it's heterogeneous in in cohesion, right? So you want to spot the the weakest area. There are some pre, you know, some tests. Maybe there are individual knights that are want to prove their, you know, their ability. They have to show off and things that they they decide to to be the the test guys that that, that charge into an area that they spot to be weaker, so that they can they can't test the the, the resistance and the, the larger formation can eventually charge. There are properly certain cavalry charges that are aborted. Like that is to say, they arrive at a few meters, and then they see that the the enemy line remains cohesive. They stop, they hold, or they open up in two wings. They they go around again, and they they reform because, uh, you know, it, it's always a risk, right? But for the rest, when a cavalry charge does happen, uh, it does literally smash into the enemy ranks. In, in front of pointy stuff like spears, spikes, things, and, and the horses are properly trained to, to charge into it. So you want to select the most aggressive-minded animals that really are also, uh, you know, properly hyped by the fact that, because the horses realize they are all together there. They're with their masters, they're, they're the riders, they, they they have to show off. They understand that something's going on. It's, they, they understand it's a big day, it's a big time. They're all together. When they charge all together, they do feel hyped themselves. And that's what they're designed for. So by selecting the most aggressive, you basically choose um, the, 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 the psychological type that, he, that will go for that kind of... of 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 uh, apparent madness that, however, is very rational if you look at it in the tactical um, uh, logic of things. Just like for men, like there are uh, just a few men that are willing properly, you know, that are able even just to go there and kill whatever. These horses are chases, um, uh, chosen by predispositioning in this in this sense, right? They were trained to rear up and strike with their hooves against infantry, for example. These horses literally kicked. They were big. Things as we've seen, they they would smash human beings with their hooves. They would bite them. Right? They were trained. They, they, getting close to a war horse is one of the, the single most dangerous things that can happen to you on a battlefield. Right? You will end up being you know bit, seriously bitten, smashed, you know, broken, killed. But because these animals are actually able to 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 attack you, and to attack other horses for that matter. Uh, as well, and and that's what uh, if you want moral forces, as we said countless times, are dram the most dramatically un underestimated 
factor in military history. We know it, that they're actually the single most important thing in relative terms. Uh, this is true for men that make war, but this is true for, for, for animals, for horses as well in this case. Right? That there is a, a, a properly a moral dimension there that these beasts were selected for that today we don't see anymore because we don't train uh, uh, these animals for, for those specific tasks and we also properly lost the art right, of selection of training um, and, um, and all that accompanied them. We, we have properly to imagine uh, a lifestyle of these animals that, was, that, that were often properly part of also the same human activities at a public level that there was all a religious belief attached to them. These horses were basically embodying the uh, in all Indo-European religions and beyond the, you know, the, 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 the religious, the, 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 the connection, the spiritual connection of the man of the hero, of the knight, uh, with, with, with the ketonic, with the uranic dimension, um, the, 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 the horse is the, both the, the blood of the earth and the, you know, the, the winged one that brings heroes to, to heaven, right? So that this connection between sky and earth, um, it's proper of all, of, of all, of all our, our Indo-European mythology that you find them everywhere, right? Of course, the, 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 the Eurasian steppes were well, this this legacy lived more on, but if you look at the wall set of Indo-European peoples in the West, from Greeks to Romans, Celts, Germans, they all believe the same identical religion that basically gravitated around the horse, right? Uh, erase from your mind the bullshit that you have been told in an Enlightenment positivistic sense of you know, the infantryman, like for the state, the citizen, or the Greeks, the Romans. That that's complete knowledge. They didn't reason at all like that, right? It's like even a even for anybody who knows history of religions, of culture, even the art of these peoples knows it's, it's nonsense. It's completely the other way around. There was a radical aristocratic ethos behind all these beliefs. Um, people were literally nuts in an individualistic sense, even a, an Hellenic Oplite fundamentally, and possibly also properly because it was, you know, an amateur of war, was just essentially ob obsessed with a figure like a serial psychopathic uh, killer like Achilles and all what basically everybody believed the same thing at the time, right? If you look at the Near East, uh, it was all about these uh, idea of the celestial deity of the sky that permeated everybody, the spirit of, look at the great ears, they all have a horse, right? Look at Alexander and what it meant for all the, 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 the world civilization in absolute standards to, to our days. Like, it, that's, that's, that's a horse. We, we venerate our ideal of mankind as, as a horseman still, right? Um, it's, it's true. In part, they erased this kind of identity for us, but it was the norm at the time. Uh, there were various types of these horses that, as, as we were saying before, they were not just Nizan. Media was um, the you know the the, the Nizan uh, plain the Zagros mountains whatever were, were prized for that were naturally other horses other breeds um, we talked about Seleucid cavalry at some point the the royal stables of Apameia uh, the Median influence uh, Antiochus the third and Abbasis that eventually you know brought cataphracts surprise surprise into the Seleucid army to be found also against the Romans, and so on. So uh, there is a deep connection, but there were also other places, other, other races, other types, right? Most of these horses seemingly were black chestnut, there were other types, for sure. Um, the mm, generals uh, sometimes used to, to ride the white ones. It's like a bit like, you know, Plato's uh, chariot myth, that he is... Uh, there is the, the black horse, is the, the bloody one, the, the earthly one that brings you down, chronic, to, 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 to hell, right? You know, whereas the, the, the white one is the pegasus, the winged one brings you to, to the ethereal world of the heavens and light and, and glory um, and, and all these things. So there was a, a, a radical symbology also attached to colors. Um, uh, the Persian, uh, speaking of the Persian Empire, that had, as you know, a, a very you know complex and systematic, uh, systematized military system. Uh, Media was not the only place that produced good horses, as we were saying before. Uh, Chilicia, for example, uh, provided the king of kings with 
um, traditionally with 360 white horses as a tribute every year. Same goes for Armenia that provide horses in, 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 in tribute. Um, Xenophon says that the Armenian horses were, quote, smaller than the Persian ones, but much more finely bred. Hmm? Which is important because, as we are saying before, um, I kind of lost a bit myself, uh, as always, but um, next to these beefier types were also lighter ones. You want some kind of, uh, you know, medium type of horse, of you know, some heavier one, and also the heavy ones, they're not just the ultra-heavy ones, right? So, um, this was really very, very varied in, in practice. We just get, naturally, and mostly from Persian art, right? You know, that cared a lot about the horse, etc. This uh, vision, essentially, because as we were saying before, there was a deep religious meaning to the whole thing. Uh, this uh, Nizan uh, horses also some imports could be from the Fergana uh, types well you know there was a market in this sense and of course the great empires such as the Chinese the Persian we would get the, the best right especially for for the, uh, the for royalty for the emperor for uh, for these public parades etc in fact these types of horses carried uh, pulled the the chariots of the king of kings um, also they're depicted uh, together with our amans the caring so uh, they obviously were conceived in all their deep political sacral cultural value as we 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 get them, uh, from here um, and as we were saying before that there were also local uh, cross breeds right later writers say that, for example, that Armenian horses had Parthian blood. Mm -hmm. So, perhaps indicating they had been crossbred with the Nizan herds that were at the time under Parthian ownership and were fair-sized, um, fair-sized, spirited, but clumsy. Right, the same goes for Cappadocian horses of being similar. Now, this is interesting because you see, when you speak about Armenia or Cappadocia, uh, etc., you are looking at very specific um, cultural realities that naturally had been invested at this point by the conquerors of the of the Persian Empire, uh, namely, you know, the the Macedons that had deeply also Hellenized certain, you know, local warfare uh, in a sense. But w what is, you know, Hellenistic also without uh, Achaemenid and all these, the various syncretism for which the same civilization is famous for. Uh, Armenia and Cappadocia look dramatically uh, similar, or at least they are pretty evidently influenced more by, by, by Persian warfare historically than by eventually Greek one. This is important because, as we've seen, it's not just about the Persians, it was just by Assyrian times, etc. So, um, especially in in cavalry, that uh, surely at this point is also influenced by the Macedonian more, but you know, still, uh, you know, literally the finest breeds, including actually even the Alexandrine ones, right? You know, eventually the, the successor states of Alexander surely used Nazian uh, breeds as well, right? So, that specific equestrian culture was much owed much definitely uh, to, uh, to to Persia itself. Uh, it is possible that the uh, you know archaic Macedonian uh, few, you know uh, war horse, feudal war horses breeds for which you know they were basically the heaviest cavalry in Europe may have been crossed with northern breeds also from the steppes. And that, therefore, there might have been uh, maybe an influence properly from the Scythians um, and not by the Persians. But as you know, the Achaemenid Empire invaded the Balkans, Greece, etc. Macedonia was, was at, at a time a vassal of, of the Persians. So uh, the easier access was fundamentally to, to those horses, at least from a certain point. Right? I don't know, the, as we've seen, the Spartans normally, you know, at times, we not at least got horses from Persia, but let's say 
Athens especially, also Sparta, they mostly had um, Sicilian and Italic breeds that were also basically the most prized in Greece specifically. But in general, these these breeds uh, moved, right? They were prized, etc. In, in in the broader Middle Eastern area, also we speak of, you know, Near East, I don't know, we speak of Armenia, of, of Cappadocia, etc. You see there at least as far as I've seen in many years looking at these cultures, it's fundamentally more of a Persian influence, and there is no doubt. But properly, it's a, it's a political and social matter, right? The Armenia and, and Cappadocia are fundamentally feudal realities, just as Persia, right? They, they are part of this broader also territorially, right? At the, from the Anatolian plateau to through the Caucasus to the Iranian plateau, it's the... Uh, what's it? What's called basically the you know the the, the mount? It's, it's all this great enormous uh, belt of of mountains that you know produce also certain similar types, not just of cavalry but also infantry at some point. And they had been heavily Persianized because the Persia had or in Mesopotamia had been the center of civilization before you know Alexander's Alexander's conquest. So it's perfectly normal uh, as we see. Um. So, what would these uh, horses look like? There, there are there is a significant amount. I mean, they're you know they're yeah. They're, they're also, they are geared the um, the the accoutrement and so on. Well, you know we can draw a sketch. So this horse had his mane cut short. Usually, they had both the forelock and the tail were tied up with ribbons. The forelock forming a plume. Um, these were all ritual aspects they, they had to do with practical problems. As we're seeing before, for example, tying the uh, the horse tail was a practical measure to properly avoid enemy cavalrymen, you know, pulling the the tail, which, as we've seen, was both a way to to actually harass the the horse, but uh, to also prove that you know you could be so. Uh, courageous to get so close to the enemy and to, to be able to do this thing and simply there was a lot of grappling properly in these melee so there was something less you could be you could use fundamentally to uh, to to f to fend the enemy to to molest the enemy uh, the brittle shows often uh, colors like red or pale brown leather right uh, sometimes it was uh, studded with bronze or let's say linked with you know um, with linked bronze plates right uh, boars tusk shaped ornaments of stone bone or bronze could be worn where the straps crossed mm -hmm. reins could be I don't know red edged white this kind of thing uh, the bit could be bronze or iron and some are quite severe, so also consider the sometimes these horses were very difficult, right? Uh, a, a great, you know, a, a great horse needed a great horseman to to be tamed. Uh, this is part of the whole deal. There was always this duality in the horses we've seen before that can be, you know, quite intelligent but also, you know, quite hot tempered, and uh, there were literally different characters as we've seen before. And you needed a very heavy control on the animal. It was very strong, so you had to, you know, make him break consistently and to, to be a bit. But also, um, as we've seen, you know, uh, it, they were also designed to be obedient on, on the road in general. And um, th as you understand, there isn't much of a harness here, um, as we see from most uh, figures here today. We don't talk about cataphract armor things like that we will see it in uh, another occasion right here we're talking just about the Persian cavalry horse altogether and how it was seen mostly in late Achaemenid art um, the usually there are also large saddle clothes depicted typically long on the back and heavily embroidered often with scalloped edges and sometimes several clothes were worn Xenophon in the uh, Kudo Pedia writes that they they have more coverings on their horses. Speaking of the Persians, on their horses than on their couches, 
right? Because they said they wanted to be comfortable, essentially. They didn't care much about the horse, but properly for, for the horseman. This, this is important because it's not a matter of, uh, you know, uh, weakness or, wh- or whatever. That there, there is all a chapter in, in this kind of um, properly war horse archaeology that, that still has to explain, for example, how... Uh, such shock cavalry properly worked without, if so powerfully without stirrups, meaning that the horses were dramatically performing, physically speaking. So um, stirrups were not around, and therefore we think it was lots of, of, of a system of leather straps, especially when the contus charged with double hand um, grip was, was carried out. Basically, you can't hold the bridles or at least you know you can partially control the horse so that's also why you had to be so obedient and to move left or right with a simple hint of, of the rider um but properly that, that was a, a comfort for for these sometimes very heavily lo- uh, you know uh harmored um and therefore loaded uh horsemen to properly stand on on, on the saddle Right, because they, they were both striped and they were heavy, so they had sometimes it was all, all a development properly of the accoutrement and the saddle, etc., to literally make these guys, you know, fixed on horseback and to never kind of uh, even not to fall at impact, which was a big deal um, at this point, especially without syrup, as we were saying. Um, the cloth was held; uh, these clothes were held on by similarly, you know, you know to say decorated breast straps on probably girt, right? Um also um there are other more typically, you know, folkloric traits. There is all a, a tradition showing bells hanging from, from collars, right? This um is optional, right? Sometimes you find it um, you know, but you find it occasionally in Persian art, but let's say it went beyond we know even Saracen saddle clothes had this thing. And so you, you find it in, in many different cultures. Um, it, it all stems even in there from the steps. Like never think that this typology of equestrian culture was just Persian, whatever. This, this thing spread most as we know as Indo-European and even beyond. And bells were meant properly even in here. They had both an, uh, an ideal and, and material purpose. Right? The, the ideal one was that these belts were participating to the broader rhythm uh, of of the universe, of of the earth, of the sky. That the horse, as we've seen, was the medium of that. It's as if the the spirit of 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 the heavenly military glory of the skies passed through these belts, and r- that ringing made the the enemy nervous. That was the practicality of it. it was like hissing arrows, or other war cries. You know, it was part of this wall also very scenographic way of war um and um they are the same of they, they were meant to replicate the same rhythm together with the clopping of the horse whatever with the um shamanic trance of um indo-european religions to which you know properly the rites of passage of warriors were were made uh, this stuff is to be found everywhere it was together with music Right, another thing that we have completely removed from our understanding, aside from 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 the, even the, the the knowledge that this was present basically in a, in any ancient people, is that music. Uh, this was a mul- war was a multisensorial experience. Like properly, the deity passed the predominance of moral forces through these through these sounds and visions. Right, you know when you had, I don't know, a you know a, a Parthian shift in. Um, a partner chieftain from from the Caspian area was riding on the battlefield under a hail of arrows and 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 you know with all these troops that is right you you the people at the time this tribesmen whatever wouldn't see this guy as as a human being it was seen as a hero as a demigod right through which the whole glory of, of heavens would pass through right and this was frightening. These horses, they, they, this this man covered in iron, whatever, they embodied, they looked like the same deities of the mythologies, of the of, of, of these stories were dramatic, they were frightening. All these people had in, in, in their mindset since they were children, all these stories of these terrifying 
merciless, bloodthirsty deities of war would cut, you know, human beings like grass from the top of these celestial horses that these magnificent beasts definitely embody, right? So, uh, there is nothing in this world that is not connected to this vision, and there is hardly anything more imposant in the world than one of these single horsemen with their horses, right? Uh, there were not tanks, not uh, helicopters around. Literally, if there is a, a, a pack of clothes uh, knit, um, uh, profession, lifelong trained, uh, heavily armored horsemen with their retinues that the swarm around. They, there is literally nothing that can stop them, right? Uh, only great empires that, in fact, also embody themselves with these elite bodies of heavier troops and the finest bred horses and this broader look of civilization can stop. And that's where the greatness stems from. Altogether, so it's it's always within this perspective that you have to to imagine the world of those times, what they really looked at like, what they really thought it like, right? Uh, the the same Greeks, the same Romans were fascinated with this stuff. They they loved it, and they they were aware that back in the day they came from the same from the same background, uh, and that is definitely. Um, you know, a, a big point to understand in military history, in our culture. And uh, we try to make a bit by bit uh, like uh, like this, right, and uh, every video. But for today, we stop it here. Really, we will actually come back on history of war horses, of, you know, typology of horsemen, whatever. The, the, today was video was dedicated to an, the animal as such and very specific... Um, space and time frame right but we will definitely expand on this and this is broadly connected to the knighthood series that we make right um also all right so for now we really stop here i just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content and for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.